we're live. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Judicial Proceedings Committee. Today is Tuesday, January 18th. We have 10 bills on the docket. We'll start off with Senate Bill 80. We'll move to 87, 146, 104, 43, 75, 76, 147, 105, and then we'll round it out with Senate Bill 25, Senator Cassidy. Up first is, I see Senator Edgert is here. So Senate Bill 80, welcome. The floor is yours. Let me unmute you here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of Judicial Proceedings. I'm glad to be here for our very first bill of this session, hoping that this uh, rerun of this bill, it's the third time it's been introduced at Senate Bill 80, which would exempt golf carts on Hooper's Island, both upper and lower, um, from being registered um, so that they can go ahead and use those on the island. We currently already instituted this practice about five or six years ago in the town of Vienna because there were no county roads there. And again, Hooper's Island is a lot like Vienna, except it's on an island. It has only county roads, no state roads once you get over the bridge. And uh, this is Dorchester County's top priority for passing this year. So I urge your favorable consideration and passing again this bill. Um, we You all passed it unanimously last year. It gets stuck over in the House. So we're trying to work those kinks out this year. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Senator Eckert. I was going to ask you the, the, the legislative history because I thought we passed this, but good to hear yes. us. We'll get to work on it then. Thank uh, you. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Thanks, you too. I'm seeing no questions on this uh, very complex and controversial bill. Um, we'll move on. So with that, that'll Thank end you. the hearing. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank Senator you. Ashton. Have a good one. You too. All right. That ends the hearing for Senate Bill 80. We'll now move on to Senate Bill 87. Senator Young, are you in the Zoom room? So I do not see Senator Young. I spoke with his office and they are getting him on. I also do not see his witness on for the first bill. Um, is Senator Cassidy on? He is. Um, I don't know if he wants to go ahead and do Senate Bill 25. There are no witnesses if he's ready or if he just wants to hold and we'll wait to get Senator Young on. All right, let's see. If Senator Cassidy is, is ready, then we'll go. If not, understood, uh, because it's kind of springing them on you. Uh, if not, Senator, we'll work way back up. Senator Wallstrick, are you, Vice Chair Wallstrick, are you ready? If not, don't worry. Uh, I know we're kind of springing this on you. So if, if you are, then yet yeah, we can rock and roll. If not, then uh, we'll talk back to you later. There you go. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, it's a little um, premature, but I'm happy to go. I'm just not sure my uh, witnesses are here. They're um, not. Okay. All right, let's go back to Senator Cassidy is unmuted. Let's see if Senator Cassidy is ready to roger up. He's actually stepped out for a minute. So I don't know if you want to go with somebody else or if you want to wait a minute. It must be 2022 legislative session because we are all squared away and ready to go. All right, so we'll, we'll hold on that. Thank you very much. We'll just hold on Senator Cassidy as well. All right, Sandy, we'll just take a pause and we'll wait for Senator Young or Kramer. Just stand by for another minute or so.
Hey, Senator Cassidy, how are you? We're waiting for some witness for some other senators to, to populate in the room. But if you're ready to go, it's Senate Bill 25. <laughs> we can give the floor over to you if you like, because I know you don't have any witnesses. Sure, I'd be glad if to. Not, if not, uh, you know, no worries. No problem. And just there, there we also have a a brief amendment because it's uh it's it says uh Christians are supposed to be. I'm sorry, it says Christopher is supposed to be Christian. So we'll deal with that one later in committee. Um Thank you, uh, colleagues, uh, Mr. Chairman. Hearing on Senate Bill 25. So this is uh, this bill's been in before, and currently uh, under the law, uh, a um, if you're charged with uh, reckless or negligent driving, uh, you get you get the citation uh, from the officer, and then the person cited would have uh, the option of simply paying the fine by mail and never coming into court which in most of your negligent or reckless driving cases is probably not the worst thing to happen. Uh, the, and, and, and it allows for the expeditious resolution of these matters. It's a bit different, however, when the reckless or negligent driving results in the death of somebody else. And that's what this bill addresses, where uh, someone was killed as a result of reckless or negligent driving. Should we, should we continue with the policy of simply allowing uh, folks to pay uh, by mail and ever coming into court. Uh, and the, 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 the challenge we face is that the, this reckless or negligent driving ticket given by a, an officer on the scene after their investigation, uh, and now it goes off and the person pays and that entire matter disappears. Uh, that just, in my view, doesn't equate to su su sufficient justice in the case of a traffic fatality. Um, I think that uh, the the interest of the victims and the, or the victim's family would be to have uh, actually treat this as a very serious matter, which it is, and require people to actually come into court so that a judge can review what has happened here, so that a prosecutor in person reviews what happens here, and it's not simply left up to the citing officer to issue the ticket and for the the uh, perpetrator to, to simply pay the fine. Um, there, there is a, a aspect of coming into court that lets people know that justice was done. I mean, you see this even on minor matters, uh, even, even minor traffic offenses or even civil, uh, civil matters. People coming into court is essential. It's part of the healing process. Uh, we see this in every kind of case. Does it, it, it can be a brief a breach of contract case. It can be a, a, a minor tort, somebody falling, slipping and falling. Uh, having people come into court is, 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 is essential to the healing process. And that becomes, well, that's not so important if the reckless driving simply caused you to lose your bumper and have to spend a few hundred dollars to get a, on, on car repairs. It is an important process when you've lost your loved one or where in some of the cases, the, the, the victim has lost an arm and a leg and is forever uh, confined to a, a wheelchair with substantial medical costs. I'd like to draw your attention to, there's some, some letters of support that were submitted. And I just wanna review a few of those with you uh, to ask you to take a look at those, please. Uh, the first one uh, is, is from uh, uh, Stephanie Butcher, her testimony. She is a sister of, of a, a young man uh, uh, who was killed. The next is um, from Julie Sturek, and her brother was seriously injured and her sister-in-law killed in an automobile accident. Um, and a third is from uh, uh, Madeline Zidon, Z-D-O-N. Uh, she's the mother of a critically injured young man. Uh, in each of these cases, these folks testified that uh, how just the, the lack of closure, because they, they, they've never met killed their loved one. They've never even seen that person. Uh, and, and now it's over, a fine was paid. And, and what will likely happen in these is, uh, assuming that the, the perpetrator, maybe they had $40,000 in, in insurance on their car, uh, the insurance company will settle for policy limits and it's done. That's it. Um, you can't go, they're, 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 they're probably judgment proof beyond the, the policy of their insurance. So someone killed your loved one uh, and that gets the following, the person who, who committed it pays a ticket and their insurance company sends you a check for the balance for the uh, policy limits and you're supposed to just get over it. You've never seen the person, they've never apologized, they've never faced anyone, 
Um, there's never a judge to review this to see if this is actually fair. And that's what we're addressing here. Another, another letter from uh, Thomas Adon, uh, the, the, um, he's the, an individual who lost an arm and a leg and never did get to see his, um, the, the person who, who caused him such grievous injury. Uh, we've got a, a letter from Montgomery County Office of Intergovernmental Relations that says that attending a court appearance is often an important part of healing process for deceased victims, family members. We frequently express grief and frustration to members of Montgomery County Department of Police's Collision Reconstruction Unit that drivers can simply pay a fine after causing the death of their loved one. And you say, well, they got sued, but that's insurance money. It wasn't the, it wasn't the perpetrator. They're, they're, they're done. They, they, their, their insurance policy paid out the limits. There's nothing out of their pocket. They move on. We've got the testimony of, of Scotty Schellenberger, Baltimore County State's Attorney, to the same effect that allowing a, a defendant charged with this offense to pay for home to pay for home imposes more pain on the victim's family. Making these offenses a must appear will give a surviving family a moment to feel some accountability and maybe even an apology. Uh, we've got a support letter from Sierra Club uh, of Maryland stating that um, they, their view is that the, they also may have to face people who lost a loved one in an accident caused, uh, caused by their driving. So again, the idea of making people come out and at least facing, facing the consequences of their action uh, seeing the, 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 the victim's families or the victim, the, the main victim, got support from uh, uh, the uh, bike uh, AAA, the bike advocates uh, for, for Annapolis and Arundel County supporting this legislation. We've got a support letter from AAA and they, they, they cite a couple of cases. Uh, one was the driver who crossed the yellow line on the Maryland road in North Baltimore County causing crashing into the vehicle, uh, killing a driver, a 60 year old Chuck Stoker, in November of 2007, uh, the reckless driver didn't have to appear in court, and he was submitted to mail on the payment. They cite um, August 2008, fatal uh, accident involving a driver who fell asleep crossing the, the Bay Bridge center line, causing a fatal crash that sent a tractor trailer plunge, plunging into the water and claiming the truck, the life of truck driver John Short Sr. The person was, again, the perpetrator was allowed to simply pay the violation. She paid a $470 fine. And that was the end of that matter. We have um, uh, a third one they cite is October 2008 when teenager Ryan Dedome, uh, for whom this bill was named, was killed riding a vehicle that veered off the road and crashed. The driver of the vehicle was charged with traffic citations totaling $710 in fines and never appeared in court. And, and they point out there was never any opportunity for the families of these three individuals to have their day in court to express their grief, their, their, their grief face the the offending driver uh, before a judge and their positions at deadly crashes should not be treated the same as simple as simple non-life-threatening crashes and it should be mandatory for drivers of, involved in fatal crashes to appear in court and not have the convenience of simply paying uh, by clicking their computer and, and transferring money from their credit card uh, and, and never leaving the comfort of their their, their home. Uh, and that the victims of victims should be afforded the opportunity to have their day in court uh, for the tragedy that will affect them for the rest of their lives. The support letters from Abate, uh, the motorcycle club, uh, as you can well imagine, they face a substantial additional um, hardships. Um, so I'd ask you all to, for your support. Uh, I'm not sure how many witnesses actually made this for, for the uh, video here, um, but I look forward to a favorable report on this. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues. Answer any questions anyone has. Excellent. Thank you very much, Senator Cassidy. Uh, looking around the room for questions, seeing none, and you have no witnesses, that's correct, right? Correct. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you for bringing this to us. I'll, I'll share something with you offline that, that happened in my personal life recently. It's, so it's touches thank on you. a little bit, but thank you, colleagues. To go forward. All right, thanks with that. No questions, that'll conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 25. And we'll now move back to Senator Young. Uh, Senator Young, I see you're there. Are you ready to provide testimony? I'm gonna unmute you there. Um, yes. Okay, great. We'll start off with Senate Bill 87. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, this is a bill that I had before you last year. Um, it passed the House 100 to 30. Uh, at least the crossfires bill did and uh, got no vote on, uh, I believe on, on their side. Um, it's called uh, 
uh, do not uh, block the box or don't block the box. Right now, if a vehicle pulls into an intersection before the light turns red and blocks the intersection, the police have no authority to do anything. Uh, so this bill is requiring that you not uh, block the intersection. When you do, it just causes all kinds of problems, uh, morning and evening uh, rush hours, traffic can't go the other way because the street's blocked, it causes extra burning of fuel. Uh, it's not safe for pedestrians, bicycles. As I said, cars can't go the other way. Uh, all this bill does is allow the police uh, to enforce not blocking the, the uh, intersection. So they can't enter the intersection at any time unless they know they can go all the way through. Um, it doesn't introduce any new fines or anything. It just all falls under existing law other than they uh, uh, can't block the intersection. Um, I know that the police would like to have the authority to do something with this. Uh, I just moved, but I lived on the street that uh, I had to drive way around because my intersection was blocked constantly. So when I was offered to cross by this bill, I, ju I jumped on it because it, it's just, it was a traffic mess and uh, people on our street couldn't get out of the street. So uh, that pretty much covers it. I think it's a good bill. And as I said, it passed the house last year. Hope it passes both the house and Senate this year. I'd be glad to take questions. Thank you, Senator Young. I'll, uh, I think you have one witness actually. Let's see, the, we'll go to the witness. Is Miss Daphne, Daphne is here? I don't see her in the waiting room. Okay, great. Oh wait, she just, she just got it in. Hold on one second. All right. Ms. Daphne, is Christy, hey, you are up. I know you just got into the room, but we just, uh, Senator Young just finished his testimony, and so you are the first and only witness. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, great. I'm sorry. I had some technical difficulties. Don't worry. Welcome. Um, you can proceed whenever you're, whenever you're ready. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to testify today in support of SB 87. Uh, I think that this is a really important, um, an important bill that will help to improve safety at intersections, both for motorists as well as for pedestrians and other road users. Um, I know that uh, other states and localities have similar laws on the books, um, but here in Maryland, we don't have the ability to enforce uh, some of the laws uh, when it comes to blocking uh, intersections or blocking other uh, infrastructure like crosswalks. Um, I think by you. putting this bill in place, uh, you would be able, we'd be able to better enforce and improve safety for everyone so that people can um, both improve the flow of traffic as well as uh, make sure that uh, pedestrians and bicyclists can be safe when they're using the roadway infrastructure. That's all that I have to say. I just hope uh, for a favorable report and that you all uh, are willing to support this important legislation. Excellent, thank you very much for taking the time to testify today and I'm glad we got the technical difficulties worked out. All right, with that, that concludes the testimony. We have two questions. I saw Senator West first, and then we have Vice Chair Walsh right here. So uh, Senator West, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'm looking at the bill on page four it says that the police officer may not issue a citation for a violation unless the approach to the intersection has appropriate signs installed that notify the public that a vehicle may not make a movement at the intersection that violates this subsection. I think so if I'm approaching an intersection, I would have to look around to see if there's signs and if there's no signs, it means I can block the box. It doesn't make much sense to me. Wouldn't it be better to just delete this language so that the rule applies universally at every intersection in Maryland, whether or not there's signs or not. Senator Young, let me go ahead and go ahead and unmute yourself. I have I have no problem with that. Usually, uh, in most of the laws, I know they require a sign to be 
put up. I mean, I think good judgment tells you shouldn't block the intersection, but um, obviously a lot of people don't use good judgment. So, <laughs> um, I just think, you know, when you get to an intersection, you decide, okay, now maybe I want to go through and, and stop in the middle of the intersection and wait, even if the light turns red, but but if you unless you've checked the signage coming to the intersection, you wouldn't know whether you could do that or not. It seems to me there ought to just be a rule that you don't block the box. Um, frankly, I, I have no problem with that. I we I think we put the sign in because they generally require signs. But if it can be done without a sign, I mean personally, that's okay with me. Okay, good. Thank you so much. All right, hey, Senator Young, if you could remain unmuted, or uh, Vice Chair Walsh has a question. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to reach out and say thank you to Ms. Daphnis. Um, some of you know Ms. Daphnis. She's a longtime uh, high-ranking federal official. And I, I just want to thank her for her service to our country, but, but also in Montgomery County. Um, no one is a more important voice when it comes to road safety and pedestrian safety than Ms. Daphnis. We all turn to her for her technical expertise and appreciate her advocacy. So I just want to, to thank her for coming in and testifying on this important bill today. Thank you for thanking her. There you go. Thank you, Ms. Daphnis. All right, excellent. We are looking around the room for additional questions from the committee. Seeing none, that will conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 87. Next up, we have Senator Young again with Senate Bill 146. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is for plug-in electric uh, vehicles. Um, what we're trying to trying to do is uh, prevent people from parking in them in them that aren't electric vehicles. Uh, we have an increasing number of electric vehicles on the road. I think something like. 36,000, the last count I saw, I'm probably sure there's more than that now. And at the time there were only 3000 places to park and charge them. So uh, this would just allow ticketing for someone parking there that's uh, not an electric vehicle. Uh, I This bill also passed the house last year. Um, I amended the bill I had in uh, to fit the uh, House bill that, that uh, passed. Uh, there's uh, also an amendment that allows uh, all spaces to be counted as the requirement that have to be provided uh, just as handicapped spaces are counted. Uh, again, uh, you know, we're, I think we're gonna see a mass increase in electric vehicles. And I hope we try to keep up with spaces for them. I've read uh, studies where uh, I mean, every, every uh, car company in the country is, has announced they're gonna switch to electric vehicles. And these things tend to follow a pattern. And when they hit the upswing, it's like COVID, it goes straight up. And I think electric vehicles are uh, hitting that point. Um, I've read things where they feel it in five years, you, you might have to pay to have your car towed away because nobody's gonna want it. The electric's coming on that fast. But the point is we need to keep up with the spaces. The governor's announced, a, I think a $3.7 uh, million dollar program to uh, increase electric vehicle spaces. And um, we just want to make sure they remain available for electric vehicles. All right, excellent. Thank you very much for your testimony. The, uh, Senator Young, remind me, I, there is a, a recent Economist article that talks about this. I'll drop the chat to you, but um, excellent. We'll now move on to your, uh, your witness panel and we'll go into uh, the Sierra Club. So is Miss Rawl in the Zoom room see her in the waiting room. Right. 
she's not in the waiting room. Do you want to go to the next? Okay, great. So we'll go to uh, Van Rens. Robert, I see you there. Mr. Van Rens, you're up next. Uh, Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Smith. Um, with the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with the uh, committee's permission, I may have to turn off my video while testifying. Uh, our broadband is down right now, so I'm actually logging in using my phone, and it's not the most stable connection. So if it starts to freeze, I may turn off the video to maintain the connection rather than drop off. So, Understood. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so I'm here to ask for a favorable vote on SQ 146. Um, I'd like to start off with a little bit of background. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, personal automobiles and light trucks that burn fossil fuels currently contribute approximately 29% of total carbon emissions in the US, um, directly contributing greenhouse gases that exacerbate climactic instability and result in an increasing number and severity of weather events, which as we all know, tax our infrastructure and cost local, state, county governments money. Um, as a country, we don't have any choice but to start reducing these carbon emissions. Um, massive reduction in the extraction and use of fossil fuels are the fastest ways to do this. The US and worldwide automotive industries have undertaken an electrification of their fleets. Um, almost all US auto manufacturers are expecting to produce primarily or entirely plug-in electric vehicles by the end of the decade. Um, the end of the 2020s at, as, as the end of the decade. Um, investment bank ING's uh, guidance to investors indicates that between 2015 and 2020, the EV fleet in the US grew by 28%. At the same time in Europe, that same fleet grew by 41% and in China by 51%. Big part of the slower rate of expansion is due to the limited charging network available in the US. There are approximately 46,000 individual chargers available nationwide, uh, a little over 3,000 available in the state of Maryland. At the same time, there are over 115,000 individual gas stations able to fill an average of 10 vehicles at a time, meaning that over a million individual automobiles can fuel up with gasoline at the same time. So there's a vital need to expand public access to charging stations and to expand the electric grid infrastructure to meet that new demand, along with adapting current facilities and current laws and ordinances to meet the requirements of this new vehicle fleet. Um, research by several agencies- we can have you uh, briefly conclude. I know you had some oh, uh, explanation uh, at the front end, so go ahead. Sure, I'm sorry. Um, essentially what my testimony boils down to, and I emailed copies of it to all the members of the, um, of the committee, is that this bill will enable particularly smaller towns and rural communities where there may be a very limited number of charging stations to protect the stations that are there and make it more practical for residents who don't have the ability to have an overnight charging station at home or for visitors who are coming from out of town who drive an electric vehicle to access vehicle charging there. And it provides a sort of part of the puzzle on the step towards expansion, making charging available on a wider range and making it possible for municipalities and county governments to protect, in some cases, a limited number of charging spaces and ensure that they're available um, in the event that you know, somebody decides, well, I don't, I don't want to have electric cars around here and I'm going to make sure that it's as hard as possible on those drivers, which unfortunately is a thing that happens much as we might wish that it doesn't. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I support you a little bit extra time because I know you're explaining some of the technical problems you're having. All right. Thank you very much for your, your testimony. I, uh, Senator Young, as mentioned, I dropped the, the link to the article in the chat. Just check it out. I thought it was interesting. Uh, not leaning one way or the other on the bill, but I just thought that was interesting background. Um, okay, great. Is Miss Rawl still in the room or do we still, we don't have her. Is that right, Sandy? She's still in the waiting room or is she around? She's not in the waiting room. I don't see her at all. So now we move on to the opposition panel. 
Um, is Mr. Hartman in the room? Mr. Hartman, there you are. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. My name is Lanny Hartman, and uh, I drive an electric car. And I appreciate the Senator Young bringing this bill forward. Uh, it seems straightforward and simple, but unfortunately, it can be uh, quite complex when you uh, get down in, into the practicalities of it. Uh, the question that always comes up is, what do we do with the electric cars that park in the charging spaces and don't use them? Now, I know this bill doesn't uh, say that, but uh, Senator Young mentioned the bills that got past the, uh, the House and actually uh, through committee and, and actually died on third reading in the Senate last year. And it did have that provision in it. Um, and it, it's a valid question. And it, it came up in Howard County, Montgomery County, and Baltimore County who have laws addressing this issue. And what they decided to do was just apply it to gas vehicles that uh, just, just if you're a gas vehicle, you don't deserve to be in that spot. We'll deal with the electric cars that are not actively charging if that becomes a problem. Uh, the city of Annapolis actually requires the electric cars to be actively charging. So next month when you have in-person testimony, you might call a name to testify. They might have to say, well, he had to run to God's garage because his electric car finished charging and he had to move it because he didn't want to get a ticket. And there's things in between. Uh, just a couple months ago, Frederick County considered an ordinance that addresses this. And at first they were looking at, well, we don't want electric cars to be blocking these spots. So, but after some input, they decided to strike a balance and their, um, their text actually says, a person may not stop, stand, or park a plug-in vehicle in a plug-in vehicle parking spot space for the purpose of charging the plug-in vehicle. Right. So, so that, that's the issue. And I hope that you uh, look carefully into this and you might just want to keep the status quo and see what happens. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Hartman. We have a question from Senator Hedelman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one is, I wonder if the sponsor could address the issues that were just raised um, and whether you anticipate um, the penalty being applied across the board, whether it's a gas fueled vehicle or an um, electric vehicle that's not charging. And then two is right now, is it up to each distinct locality to determine what the penalties are? If you're, for example, a gas vehicle parked in a um, electric vehicle space. Um, well, we were trying to be straightforward with the bill to just keep gas cars out of the electric uh, charging places. Uh, he did bring some complications up. What if it's already charged? Well, if, and they could get a ticket. Well, if, if we get into that complication, uh, it actually makes it real difficult for somebody to run back. So I, I think we should just leave it to gas cars can't park in electric uh, charging spaces. And there's a need for, and that's why governor put money in to create a lot more uh, charging spaces. Um, right now, I think the penalty is $100. And uh, that I believe is state, set uh, statewide, uh, six, Six jurisdictions presently have laws protecting elect electric uh, plug-in parking. Uh, we're just trying to create a general one here. It, it still doesn't prohibit uh, modifications by local government. So, it's, so a local could have more if they determined. I think they could, yes. To go above the state minimum. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator Hedelman. Looking around the room, seeing no further questions, that will conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 146. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Young. Good to see you. you. Next, we'll go on. I see Senator Kramer's here, but we've got, uh, we'll go to Senator Riley 
Senator Riley, we'll start off with you with Senate Bill. Welcome. How are you? Uh, we'll start off with Senate Bill 43. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a pair of bills having to do with uh, speed monitoring systems. Uh, just as a background, uh, we do enabling legislation so the local jurisdiction can in put out to bid and install these speed monitoring systems. Uh, traditionally, they are near schools. For these two in particular in Anne Arundel County, so these are both local bills. The first one, Senate Bill 43, focuses on Baltimore Annapolis Boulevard, also known as Maryland Route 648. As uh, you're coming up this road to come into downtown Savannah Park, there's a rise, a curve, and a blind spot, and uh, there's a significant speed problem that speed enforcement by the local police has not been able to resolve. In this particular section, there is the BNA Trail, the most used county park in Anne Arundel County on one side of the road, and all the residents on the other on the east side of the road. And these residents try to cross the, this road to use our uh, hiker biker or trail, BNA uh, uh, BNA Trail. And it's very dangerous. We've not had any fatalities, but we've had a lot of near misses. And this bill is at the request of some of the neighbors. The interesting thing about these bills is they're an automated um, system that produces fines. And the fines go back to covering the cost of speed reduction measures, roadway and pedestrian safety measures at that spot. So it's a focused issue if people are uh, speeding, abusing the law, uh, any money that's raised is put back in to create a safer corridor. It's about a half a mile long uh, from uh, um, Holly Road to uh, Hoyle, Hoyle, Hoyle Road to Cypress Creek Road. Um, we have presented this to the Anne Arundel County Senate delegation. I'm expecting a, a vote uh, very soon. As soon as the vote is taken, I'll bring our letter to you and request that you move the bill forward to the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So thank you, Senator Riley. Looking around, uh, questions will go, we'll go on to your, your panel. Uh, next got Ms. Jeter, are you in the room? There you are. Hi, yes, how are you? Good, good, welcome. Good afternoon, my name is Pam Jeter. I'm speaking as a community liaison for the Severna Park or Old Severna Park neighborhood. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of SB 43. Our neighborhood utilizes the pedestrian crosswalks located on 648 at Brandywine and Cypress Creek. The speed cameras from this bill would cover the section of the road. Our families use these crosswalks to access the BNA Trail, to walk to and from school, the Severn Swim Club, our community beach, Cypress Creek Park, Severna Park Community Centers, and many local businesses and restaurants. This past summer, I conducted a community survey to assess the needs and experiences of our neighbors that use the crosswalk across Route 648. 112 community, community members responded to the survey. The overwhelming response was that, the, that speed was a predominant concern. When asked how safe the neighbors felt using these crosswalks, 73% of the respondents said it was not safe. 19% avoided using the crosswalk altogether because of the safety concerns. When asked about safety problems our neighbors experienced in the previous six months when crossing the crosswalk, 92% of our neighbors said that the cars were not stopping. 91% said cars were going too fast. 82% said drivers don't see or look for pedestrians. Our neighbors were also asked to report the biggest safety problem on, on Route 648 in the area and uh, where Brandywine and Cedar Creek crosswalks intersect and 88% reported speeding and aggressive driving. So in short, speed enforcement is sorely needed on that section of MD 648 for the safety of our community and installing speed cameras would be a major step in improving pedestrian safety. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Jeter. Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, Ms. Medile. There you are. Add, there you go. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Gemma Medill. I've lived in Old Severna Park for 16 years, and I support speed monitoring on Route 648. We've got community members from age 0 to 100. 
with a large range of mobility abilities that use the crosswalks over Maryland Route 648. This summer, the State Highway Administration came and trimmed trees and refreshed signs and repainted crosswalks, which was a huge help. However, it just wasn't enough to slow down the vehicles. There was a serious accident on September 23rd in one of those crosswalks. The speed monitoring would be in alignment with Maryland's Vision Zero plan to make our infrastructure more safe. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. And next we'll move on to Ms. Uh, Widman. It's Wendy here, here you go. Yes. Here you go. Uh, video. Okay. Yes. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I am a user of the trail. I have lived in my house in Old Severna Park for 37 years um, before the trail was even there. To get to the trail, I'm a, I'm a bike user and a hiker and other uses. And I uh, typically cross at Brandywine or Cypress Creek Road. Um, those two intersections, those two crosswalks seem to be particularly dangerous because of the speed the drivers uh, achieve coming off the Round Bay Road and over to the signal at Riggs and uh, 648. Um, also inattention and distracted driving. I was hit in the, in the Brandywine crosswalk, crosswalk some years ago. Um, at that time, cars had stopped both ways to let me go across the crosswalk on my bicycle and had even honked for me to proceed. And as I proceeded across the, the car going north, which was on my left-hand side, another car came zipping around him on his left-hand side and on the wrong side of the street and zapped me, crashed right into me. Um, I flipped off onto the, onto the road, roadway, dented his uh, bumper, cracked his, his windshield, and it could have been much more uh, harmful uh, um, luckily I survived that crash. I have seen a number of uh, clear uh, close misses on the trail not involving me of uh, children trying to cross the trail, going to school, uh, going to the Cypress Creek fields where sports occur, occur in the afternoons. Um, I think that a speed camera would be uh, very helpful to control the speeds that people are achieving on this on, on the straightaway there and to uh, make them pay more attention to the crosswalks as they come up on them. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your testimony. I'm glad that you were on the mend and here with us today. So thank you for sharing that. Um, with that, that'll, that ends the, the witness panel and I'll turn to the committee for questions Seeing none, that will conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 43. We'll now move on. Oh, actually, hold on. Senator Bailey, you're up. Thank you very much. And um, I just wanted to uh, ask, are there uh, flashing yellow um, markings or any other type of uh, things on the roadway uh, where those crosswalks exist? Thank you, Senator, for that uh, question. Yes, there are painted crosswalks on the asphalt, but no flashing lights. According to the uh, Anne Arundel County Public Works, uh, the, the amount of uh, volume of traffic, the speed at which they travel, do not meet the national standards for flashing lights. So uh, this is a uh, an, an effort to make it safer. And, and I've, none of the folks mentioned it, but I have to. There's also an awful lot of moms pushing baby carriages, strollers. It's a very family orientated place. And of course we say to the kids, walk your bike across the street. They don't, they look to the right, look to the left and dart out on those crosswalks. It's extremely dangerous and it's an appropriate place to slow down. And, and Mr. Chairman, I wanna, is that satisfactory uh, Senator Bailey? So <clears throat> I, I really appreciate your answer. 
we have in, uh, you know, in St. Mary's and Calvert, we have some very similar uh, issues. I'm sure most all the senators are having issues with these crosswalks. And we're doing a test right now in St. Mary's. They're getting ready to install them with the lights, very similar to what we have at where we walk over from the Senate building um, to our offices, uh, where you can plug it. It's a solar uh, and it lights up across the whole road, uh, flashing lights. And uh, I just <clears throat> I just was throwing that out there as a different alternative or maybe as two things, because obviously we don't ever want a pedestrian hit in a uh, crosswalk. Thank you, Thank you sir. No, I appreciate that, Senator Bailey. We have similar challenges in my district along uh, Colesville Road, especially it's a major artery uh, running north to south uh, from Silver Spring to Columbia. So uh, sensitive to your uh, concerns. All right, um, seeing no further questions on Senate Bill 43, uh, Senator Riley, did you want to say something else before we moved on to Senate Bill? No, no, I'm ready for 75. Okay, excellent. So we'll move on to Senate Bill 75, Senator Riley. So the, again, these, these uh, speed monitoring systems, they're authorized by the state, but the county puts them out to bid for the construction and operation. And then uh, if tickets are uh, issued, uh, the, con the um, vendor who puts up the, the speed cameras get reimbursed toward their expenses. And the rest of it, as I said, goes into the uh, uh, program for speed reduction and roadway and pedestrian safety improvement. So it's not helping the county. It's all going back into that local neighborhood. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senate Bill 75 uh, is a different type of a road. It's a rural road. It's called Woodwardville. Uh, now I'm probably the oldest guy here. When I was a young man, young boy up in North Jersey, there was a uh, five and dime called Woodward. And the owner of this chain of five and dimes actually bought the Bel Air stables in Bowie back when it was a farm. And he would come down the railroad uh, from New York, stop in Woodwardville, was a whistle stop on the train. And these, uh, as we know, Bowie is the um, birthplace of thoroughbred racing in Maryland. And he would get these beautiful racehorses hook them up to his carriage and use them to carry him from the whistle stop over to the stable. So he had a, a, a real purpose for having these beautiful uh, majestic horses. Uh, because it's a, a rural style road, there are no shoulders, there are no curbs, there's no gutters. You have people's front yards coming up to the pavement. So entering or leaving your driveway, children, living in the area, riding their bikes. Uh, there's a church there. And they, again, uh, for church services, it's very difficult. Uh, this, the uh, Anne Arundel County Road put up a 25 mile an hour speed limit when it was you know, those signs were first established and everybody ignores them. We have flashing lights. We actually have the sign that says you're going 45 miles an hour in a 25 zone. It doesn't slow anybody down. So again, this was done at the request of the neighborhood. I can share with you the effectiveness of speed monitoring systems. One day I left Crofton and I was going to Glendale. Down 450, I passed Bowie High School and the uh, Catholic school down in Bowie. And they had two uh, speed monitoring systems in front of each school and two on the way back. Well, that day I got four tickets, two down, two back, I have paid a great deal of respect to the speed limits ever since. You only have to get caught once and these things uh, inspire people to obey the law. So again, we have, uh, this was done at the uh, request of the uh, neighbors. Uh, it's been presented to the Anne Arundel County Senate delegation. I expect a vote very soon on it. Uh, if it passes the delegation, I'll be presenting a letter to the committee for uh, moving the bill forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Riley. And your uh, witness, Ms. Uh, Cornwell, you're up next. Hi, go. good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? We can, we are. Just wanted Welcome. to make sure. <laughs> 
Um, good afternoon. My name is Lisa Cornwell. I live at 969 Patuxent Road, Odenton. I'm speaking today in support of Senate Bill 75. Thank you, Senator Riley, for your willingness to submit this bill. We appreciate your efforts to help us get speed cameras installed along scenic and historic Patuxent Road. Our goal is to slow the traffic, protect the safety of our residents, and the safety of all who travel along Patuxent Road through historic Woodwardville. I represent historic Woodward, I'm sorry, I represent the historic district known as Woodwardville, established 1875 and located in Odenton, Maryland. Our small town, historic homes, church, and Patuxent Road are all on the National Register of Historic Places, as well as the state and county registries. We are situated with Piney Orchard to the north, population 8,500, Fort Meade and NSA to our west, both of which have had huge increases in employees over the past decade, Crofton to our east, and the new Two Rivers housing development of over 2,000 homes still being built to our south. The population of Odenton over the past 20 years has more than doubled according to census reports. I share this information on population increased housing and increased industry to help create a picture in hopes of gaining your support. Patuxent Road is still what you would consider a tiny little back road. Our little church operates a preschool and the road is lined on both sides with historic homes. We have no shoulder along the road and most importantly, our speed limit is 25 miles per hour. Like many other areas around our state, our area has grown faster than its infrastructure. Thousands of cars per day use our tiny little 25 mile an hour road as a shortcut, most of which are well exceeding the speed limit. We are fully aware that we're unable to stop the traffic. We simply wish to slow it down. The speeding traffic creates a safety hazard for anyone that lives along Patuxent Road. Whether trying to enter or exit our driveways or retrieve our mail, we are dealing with a very serious public safety hazard. The speeding traffic is constant. We've been working with Anne Arundel County for over 20 years and have the full support of our traffic safety and engineering department, our local councilman, the county executive's office, and the Anne Arundel County Police Department to have okay. some cameras installed. Thank you very much, Ms. Cornwell. Thank you for your time here. And with that, I'll turn uh, to the committee for questions. Seeing none, that will end the hearing for Senate Bill 75. Thank you very much, Senator okay. Riley and Ms. Cornwell. Thank you very much for taking your time. Thank you. Thanks, excellent. Senator Kramer is here. Senator Kramer, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of Judicial Proceedings. Nice to see you. Uh, ben Kramer here introducing Senate Bill 104. Um, colleagues, uh, every one of us, every two years, uh, needs to pay a fee of $14 for the pleasure of having our vehicles tested at the uh, local emissions station. Um, it's something we all do and our constituents do. However, there are a number of vehicles under state law that are granted waivers for some reason or another, and they are not subjected to the vehicle emissions testing. They also do not pay the $14 every other year that the rest of us pay. So this bill is about a tiny little bit of parity so that those people who have a vehicle for whatever reason that it may not be included in emissions testing still would pay the $14 every other year and that money would be utilized to do one of three things, uh, provide rebates on the sale of electric vehicles, two, to purchase electric transit and school buses, and three, expand the electric vehicle infrastructure. Now, it's likely that the vehicles that are exempted are vehicles that are high polluting vehicles based on their age or the fact that they kept feel, failing emissions and they put uh, some money into the repair. It continued to fail. And so now they are driving high polluting vehicles and not even paying the nominal $14 every other year uh, that the rest of us are paying. So the small amount of money is enough that in 
uh, its congregate is is could make a difference in helping uh, address the important electrification of our uh, vehicles going forward. Now, committee, I want to be very clear, there were some issues with the drafting of the bill. So here's what is coming out of the bill that was included and should not have been. And then I'll tell you what is coming in the bill through an amendment that should have been included. Coming out of the bill that is currently included are vehicles used for fire and rescue services, ambulances, uh, rescue squads, all of those vehicles. They're currently exempted. They will remain exempted. The exemption for owners of motor vehicles who meet disability requirements, they are currently out, they will stay out. And that's the amendment that I will provide. And then the third category that is coming out are our uh, service personnel, um, active duty members of the service, and um, they are currently exempted, they will remain exempted. It was never the intention to pull those three categories into this legislation. The category that was left out that you will receive an amendment that will bring in are the owners of historic vehicles. And the definition of a historic vehicle in our current statute is uh, a vehicle that is at least 20 years old, has not been substantially altered from the manufacturer's original design, and meets criteria contained in regulations adopted by the administration. Those vehicles will be coming into the bill. And again, most of them are high polluting vehicles. They may not be driven with great frequency, but when they are, uh, they disproportionately uh, contribute to our pollution problems in the state. And so for me, I own a 1970 Chevelle. I'm not required to have it tested, but there's no reason in the world why I should not be paying that $14 every other year, just like everyone else does for the vehicles that, uh, that they own. So uh, again, the goal here committee is about parity and uh, at a very, very nominal uh, amount and uh, but cumulatively can make improvements to again, our electrification and our reduction in greenhouse gas pollution and we all have an obligation and a responsibility to be working in that direction. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I will have those amendments to your office. One was already drafted um, and it may have been sent to the committee. The second, I am hoping to have by the end of the day and I'll have it to the committee. And uh, I hope you will pass this uh, important piece of legislation that, uh, makes inroads uh, on our reducing our carbon footprint. With that, certainly would welcome any questions. And thank you, Senator Kramer. Always good to see you and thank you for bringing the bill forward. We're gonna go ahead and move along with your panel first and then we'll take questions at the end. Um, so first on your panel, we have um, Mr. Palencia Calvo. Come on, here you go. Um, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Ramon Palencia Calvo, I'm the Deputy Director of the Maryland Eagle Conservation Voters. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of SB 104 and the leadership of Senator Kramer on this issue. Maryland LCB works at the intersection of addressing climate change and environmental justice, and this bill addresses both. This is a bill that will help the climate and public health. The pollution from carbon emissions not only fuels climate change, but also has a devastating effect on our health, 
especially the health of our underserved and most vulnerable communities, which have for too long been disproportionately impacted by pollution in Maryland. In order to confront the growing threat of climate change and improve community health, the state must continue to make bold steps to address the pollution from the transportation sector, which is the largest contributor to our carbon emissions. Maryland currently has a goal of 300,000 zero emission vehicles on the road by 2025. And we are still falling very short of this goal. And we need to accelerate the deployment of electric school vehicles, of electric vehicles. Using FIP revenues collected from this fee to fund electric vehicle programs, including electric school buses, will help clean our air, fight climate change, and promote equitable outcomes. Maryland LCV strongly supports the provision on this bill that designates funds from this program to the purchasing of electric school buses. We also encourage the sponsor to consider making clarifications to the bill, which would ensure that the funds collected through this program be distributed equitably using Justice 40 principles. This would require that at least 40% of funds be directed to communities underserved and overburdened by pollution. Thank Maryland LCB is strongly urges a favorable report on this important bill. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll move on to Mr. Ditzler. There you are. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you, uh, members of the committee. My name is Brian Ditzler, and I'm here representing Sierra Club, America's oldest and largest grassroots environmental organization. The Maryland chapter of Sierra Club has more than 70,000 members and supporters, and we're pleased to support SB 104 because it would level the playing field by requiring a very modest recurring fee for virtually all registered vehicles in the state, including electric vehicles, which are a growing percentage of the many vehicles exempted from participating in the state's vehicle emissions inspection program. Most importantly, the funds raised would go toward the purchase of electric transit and school buses, the expansion of electric vehicle charging infrastructure in the state, and also would help provide rebates on the sale of EVs in the state. People drive 135 million miles in Maryland daily, an amount that increases every year, according to the Maryland Department of the Environment. The transportation sector in Maryland is the number one generator of climate disrupting greenhouse gases in our state, and also is a major source of toxic emissions that are hazardous to human health. Tailpipe emissions from gas and diesel powered cars, trucks, and buses account for 89% of that pollution. One of the most effective ways to reduce those emissions is by replacing gas and diesel powered vehicles with electric vehicles. Maryland joined seven other states in signing a memorandum of understanding committing to have 300,000 zero emission vehicles on the road by 2025 and 600,000 EVs on the road by 2030. Unfortunately, we are not anywhere near achieving those commitments at the present time. This legislation is an equitable way to raise funds needed to increase the purchase of EVs and expand the EV charging infrastructure that's needed to improve the quality of the air we breathe. We believe SB 104 makes sense and urge a favorable report on this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Ditzler. And uh, next we'll move on to, is Mr. DeMarco in the room? I do not see him in the waiting room. All right, and then with that, we'll turn it over. That'll conclude the testimony for Senate Bill 104, but we'll turn it over to the committee for questions. Seeing no questions, that'll conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 104. Senator Kramer, thank you all very much. Thank you to your panelists. Have a good one. All right, next we'll move on to Senator Ellis. I see that you're in the room. Senator Ellis, you're up with Senate Bill 76. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Smith, uh, committee members. It's a pleasure to be with you um, to present uh, Senate Bill 76. Uh, for exception for golf carts to be ridden on the streets of Cobb Island. So <laughs> Cobb Island is actually an island, folks, in Maryland, in Charles County, southern edge, surrounded by Wacomico and, and uh, Potomac River, and I hope I'm getting it right, and you have to take a bridge to cross. 
that uh, waterway onto Cobb Island. Beautiful area, beautiful people. And the, they've reached out to me to uh, take care of this issue. And thank you so much for allowing me to present it to you. The purpose of the Senate Bill 76 is to establish exceptions to motor vehicle registration requirements of golf carts and low-speed vehicles on Cobb Island in Charles County, Maryland. This bill places golf carts in the low-speed vehicle category of the Maryland Transportation Code. Next slide, please. What does Senate Bill 77 do? It requires golf carts to be driven on highways with a maximum speed limit of 30 miles per hour, operate between dawn and dusk, equipped with certain lighting devices, driven by people with valid driver's license, and for them to keep on the, fright, on the far right of the roadway. It really interesting in Charles County, uh, we also have horse-drawn carts, which operate very well on our state and local roads, uh, ridden by our Amish community. So this is one step away from that. And uh, I want to say that uh, I think in Chrisfield, we all, they already have this authorization uh, for golf carts to operate on their roads. Well, why is this bill important? Well, because primary reason, uh, they're my constituents in Cobb Island. They reached out to me for several years now. We've talked. I visited them, town hall meeting, and vast majority of folks would love this opportunity to have a legal presence of golf carts on the island. They're very popular mode of transportation on Cobb Island. Their limited regulations so far led to unsafe driving experience for young drivers, which many residents have expressed frustrations over. And the lack of designated driving lanes for golf carts has created significant traffic buildup, which has made commutes more difficult. Next slide, please. The benefits, uh, of course, the residents of Cobb Island will benefit. Uh, this picture and this graph show uh, I'm standing up facing the audience uh, at a community meeting that was very well attended on Cobb Island. And uh, we listened and I asked the question, raise your hand, please, if you support this legislation. And 95% of the hands were in support. Uh, so, um, I visited and uh, made sure that this request represent the wish of the majority of residents on Cobb Island. This bill will keep drivers off all vehicles safe since it will instill safety measures and guidelines for golf cart drivers. Also, we reduce traffic congestion on roads going into and out of Cobb Island, making it easier for residents and travelers to use. Like I mentioned, there's a bridge that goes over to Cobb Island, one bridge and one <laughs> egress. And so basically this will regulate, will get things more under control, which uh, will be beneficial to residents of Cobb Island. Uh, that's my testimony. I just want to say uh, I was pleased to see the uh, M, I think M dot weighed in and the information letter deep in that letter says they have no problem with this bill, which is good. I'm happy about that. They can really uh, enforce this. So thank you, uh, colleagues, for your uh, consideration, and I ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 76. Excellent. Thank you, Senator Ellis. This is JPR, where we oscillate between golf carts on Cobb Island and the criminal justice system. Get it? <laughs> oscillate? No? Go ahead. Oscillate? Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> we'll move on to the uh, to the uh, the rest of the panel before we go to the questions. I see you, Senator uh, Sidnor. So we'll go on to um, Mr. Lawman. You're up next. I do not see Mr. Lawman in the waiting room. Excellent. Then we'll move on to Carol Davis. You're up. You can oscillate over to her testimony. Yes. There we go. I think you're uh, unmuted. Sandy, I see two Carol Davises present in the room. Yes, one is, um, it appears to be audio, the other is video. So I have requested that she unmute herself and I've requested that she also turn her video on. Excellent. I think her audio is still connecting. While she's uh, getting squared away, let's move on to Mr. Hood. I see you're up, Mr. Hood. You're up, sorry. 
Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, uh, Chairman and Sen Senators, and especially uh, Senator Ellis. Uh, my name is Patrick Hood. I do live on Cobb Island. Uh, I do have to read this little blurb from my employer, but I am a police officer uh, with Charles County. I've been a police officer for 20 years. I need to express that my statements here do not represent the Charles County Sheriff's Office. I am res uh, representing uh, uh, the Cobb Island Citizens Association. So now that we got that out of the way, I don't get fired. That's awesome. So uh, anywho, uh, I'm, I married into the island seven years ago to my beautiful wife. Uh, she is actually from the island. The island is a close knit community. Um, it, it's not a day that don't go by uh, winter, summer that I don't see anybody walking around or, or, or uh, everybody's always out. We have a lot of gatherings and events on the island. Um, National Night Out is huge. Uh, Cobb Island Day, I love Cobb Island Day. Uh, we have uh, something new, it's like the third annual Witches on the Water uh, where they get in kayaks and they go on the water. Uh, Christmas tree lighting and the Christmas parade, they're always huge, but they're all held out, held, held at the uh, Fisherman's Field. It's a big field, right? when you come across that one bridge that Senator Ellis mentioned, there's one way in, one way out. It's great as a parent. Uh, so <laughs> you can definitely go to the bridge and catch whoever you need to go, go back out. Um, but anyways, uh, they're all held at the Fisherman's Field. Um, when I first got here seven years ago, when there was no golf carts at all, uh, parking was terrible uh, It left footprints in the, uh, um, uh, in other words, in the cars parked on the field, it left mud holes and, and, uh, and ditches and all that. Um, and uh, it, it left a lot of blind spots. Traffic was treacherous. Um, like even on our Halloween, our Halloween, we have, uh, this island is filled with people on our Halloween. Uh, they come from all the way around from uh, Swan Point, from other neighborhoods. Uh, it is crowded. There's really no way anybody can drive on our streets. Um, mentioning in our roads, our roads are very, very narrow. They're, they're, they're barely two cars can go by on our road. Um, not, not, not to mention that golf carts are much easier, but, uh, even Time. Sorry, Mr. Hood, that's the, the voice of JPR God telling you your time's up here, but go ahead and wrap up, uh, really quickly. And then, okay. All right. Uh, uh, and the speed limit, speed limit on the island is 25 mile an hour. Um, golf carts go average around 20 miles an hour. So that's good. I do recommend, uh, front headlights and rear, uh, rear, rear lights on golf carts. I also recommend that you have to have a, um, valid driver's license to operate. Uh, I am in favor of making, uh, Cobb Island a golf cart community. I think it's, it's efficient. And, uh, I, I also own a golf cart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Ellis. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. Hood. And thank you for your, uh, your patience. Thank you. All right. Uh, Ms. Davis, we're now going to switch back to you. I'm going to click on your, I think you're, you've been unmuted and we can see you. So the floor is yours. So Ms. Davis, although you were unmuted, we can't hear you. We can see you, but we cannot hear you. All right. So Sandy, we're, we're going to just, we'll, uh, while Ms. Davis gets squared away, we're, I think we're going to move on really quickly here because we have a couple questions from committee members. And uh, if we can get Ms. Davis up, we'll get her up and uh, move on to questions at the moment. So uh, Senator Sidnor, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and, and this question, um, I think may actually be to, to our council. Uh, I don't expect uh, Senator Ellis to have the answer. And if he does, feel free to chime in. Uh, but certainly uh, this bill is almost exactly like the one that we uh, did on in past last year. Uh, uh, but the, the, one, the one distinction I saw is in uh, Senator Eckert's bill, uh, she, our bill speaks to county highways and this bill just speaks to highways. And I was trying to figure out if there was a distinction between a county highway and a, and a highway. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm certainly fine with the bill and want to see uh, the Senator get his victory for his constituents today. Okay, um, so uh, I just weigh in really quick, uh, Senator. Say no because I was uh, unmuted. So that means uh, speak, Ellis. <laughs> so I won't speak. Uh, so um, we have a step bridge, that one bridge going into Cobb Island. It's a state highway. 
And so uh, next for county roads. So gotcha. we, we would love for all the highways and roadways to have this uh, um, privilege. And like I said, it's not a highway like you would think of uh, a major Route 1 or 301 or 210 or those major roads. It's a state highway, but it's a small two-lane road goes onto the island and it merges into the county roads, which are on the island. And we worked closely with the bill drafters over the summer. It seemed like a simple bill, but we, we went a lot of back and forth uh, as we pre file this bill. And so maybe there is a reason for that language. I will not speak for the drafter. Uh, hopefully, if you want me to do anything to uh, get back to you with that, let me know or if you'll handle that as a committee. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're fine. I'll just speak with our council. I okay. want to make certain that you're getting the same benefits that we're getting. On, on the other bill. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And could I just uh, make one comment, Mr. Uh, Chairman? Uh, so Cobb Island is the far southern end of uh, Charles County. And the issue we have with broadband and internet access, it's real, folks. And I know my folks, my constituents doing their best to come in, but uh, they're at the last mile in Cobb Island. And so I think that might be the issue with kind of connectivity. So please uh, uh, forgive their lack of being here uh, in person or in Zoom, but uh, I know that we have quite a few uh, written testimonies sent in. So please uh, refer to that. Excellent, thank you very much, Senator Ellis, and thank you for identifying an additional uh, issue that we definitely need to tackle. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank All right, you. so I see, I see that, okay, Ms. Davis, let's try you. Let's try your uh, your system one more time, and I, I see that um, Mr. Lawman is also in as well. So we can go to Mr. Lawman, but Ms. Davis, go ahead. Oh, no joy. Um, all right, we'll, we'll continue to work on it. Mr. Lawman, you are up. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can. Sorry for the uh, problem. Like uh, Senator Harris uh, Ellis said, uh, we're at the end of the world, so. Broadband is not the best for us down here. Um, thank you for giving me time to testify on Senate Bill 76 regarding exceptions for golf cart on Cobb Island. Um, I live at, in Cobb Island along with my wife for 46 years. And my wife and I have been members of Cobb Island Volunteer Fire Department, EMS, and auxiliary for the total time frame. We're also members of Cobb Island Center Association and Holy Ghost Church. I thank Senator Ellis and his wife for attending the Cobb Island Center Association meeting and listening to our members regarding legalizing golf carts for the community. They've been working on this for over two and a half years. As most people know, the island, Cobb Island is an island and it's about three miles around the perimeter and the population is about a thousand. The island is connected to the mainland by a two lane bridge. And the posted speed limits on the island is 25 miles per hour and 15 miles per hour around the playground. The Cobb Island has a community playground, a grocery store, a post office, a coffee shop, and a small eatery, along with Cobb Island Citizen Association office and the Cobb Island Volunteer Fire Department. Many members would enjoy using the golf carts to travel to these type of establishments. There's probably about 50 to 60 golf carts on the island. Passing this legislation will give the community residents the peace of mind knowing they would be operated legally and provided safety measures that we are looking forward to. This is a close knit community and we hold several events and activities a year, such as Cobb Island Days, National Night Out, Cobb Island Christmas Tree Lighting, Santa Claus for the Children, Easter and Halloween celebrations for the children, along with several other community events. We feel this legislation for exceptions for golf carts would provide Cobb Island citizens with rules for the legal operation of a golf cart and only allow individuals with a valid driver's license to operate a golf cart and adhere to the rules. My wife and I are in favor of the passage of Senate Bill 76 and appreciate your review of this legislation with a positive outcome. And just to note, we exist now with bikers, uh, hikers, uh, Low speed hey. vehicles, everything. So this is nothing new to us. Thank you very much for your time. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawman. All right, we will try one last time. Miss Davis, let's maybe the third time's a charm here. Let's try. All right, Miss Davis, can can you hear us? Excuse me. All right. All right. Sorry about that, Miss Davis. We will uh, take your written testimony and, and uh, uh, we will try to fix this uh, for the next time you come to testify. Senator Ellis, if we pass this, we, you know, JPR needs a, a site visit to Cobb Island. Maybe we can go to Captain John's Crab House and uh, have some fun. All right. All right. Thank you, Senator Ellis, and thank you to your panel. With that, uh, that'll conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 76. Ms. Davis, our apologies. We'll get it squared away next time. All right, we'll now move on to Senate Vice Chair Walsh-Riker. We're up with uh, Senate Bill 147. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, like many of you, I've been knocking on a lot of doors lately. Actually, one of the questions I get most frequently is uh, from my constituents is, what are you working on in a bipartisan fashion uh, with members of the other party? And I I'm proud to add uh, pedestrian safety and road safety to that list. I've been really um, proud of how our committee um, has proposed these bills today. And there's so much important work in front of us. Um, so thank you to members of this committee. And, and in that spirit, I want to introduce to you uh, Senate Bill 147. Um, this bill requires that drivers approaching a disabled vehicle displaying hazard warning lights, road flares, or other caution signals from the rear to make a lane change into an available lane not immediately adjacent to the vehicle, or to slow to a reasonable and prudent speed if that is safe. Uh, we've passed similar legislation with regard to our first responders, but uh, I, I'm worried that perhaps we have um, left a misimpression about why these laws are important. Uh, when we passed the bill for first responders, um, perhaps one of the reasons we did so is because we wanted the first responders and heroes and professionals who do this work to have the time and space to do so safely. And that's important. And I'm glad that law is on the books. And of course, we've since expanded that to tow truck driver, drivers and other uh, service vehicles. Um, but the primary re reason we did it is not because of the title or the status of the people who are on the side of the road helping uh, disabled vehicles. It's primarily because of safety. And if we follow that logic, then the law should also apply to regular old disabled vehicles with no first responders or tow truck drivers assisting them yet. Uh, we all know how dangerous it can be to be on the side of the road with our flashers on. And culturally, it's important that we start to advise our fellow constituents and fellow Marylanders that the appropriate response is to move over to make space, to make sure people feel safe on the side of the road when they're uh, under difficult circumstances. Uh, I myself have been disabled on the side of a highway on Route 50 right at 495, um, and it was too dangerous to leave my vehicle. People were speeding by at tremendous speeds. The speed limit there is 55. Some people obviously go faster, and uh, it is simply unsafe. Uh, so folks need to move over. And of course, many of us know constituents or family members or, or uh, people more distant from us who have passed away, uh, who have been struck on the roadway because their vehicle was disabled and other vehicles did not move over. This is an important bill. It's the right thing to do. And I uh, look forward to a favorable report from this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Vice Chair Walsh-Riker. And we'll go on to your panel next. So we have uh, Mr. Helms first, and then we'll move on to uh, Ms. Ali. So Mr. Helms, go ahead. Uh, Senator Smith, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Dave Helms. I'm from Silver Spring. I'm a member of the, the County Pedestrian Bicycle Safety Advisory Committee. Uh, here to ask your favorable report on this bill. Uh, I'm here. Primarily, well, there's about five unintended pedestrians killed every year on, on our roads. That's basically someone who's got a disabled vehicle. My friend, uh, Sean Durkin, was one of those. He's with the formerly of the 75th Wing, uh, a guardsman, a federal fellow Marylander. He was on his way to work uh, uh, 
one, one morning, year and a half ago, saw a collision, pulled over to help, called 911, exited his vehicle, and was immediately hit and killed. He left uh, his wife, uh, Teresa, and four children. Um, it it uh, speeds in the highway speeds. You, we cover about one football field every three seconds. Uh, drivers can't distinguish between uh, unmarked car, uh, tow truck. Um, you know, if we ask them to make a decision whether or not that disabled vehicle is important enough to move over, they've already on them. So this bill, simplifying the field, the law, simplifying the education, the enforcement will make everybody safe. So please, if you can, uh, if it's important enough to approve golf carts, it's important enough to uh, encourage people uh, to move over for everyone. Uh, I, I know the one experience for me uh, on the side of the road on the Beltway is probably the, the most, I was the most afraid I was in my life. Uh, and I had a gun pointed at me once. And so that, that's something. Uh, so please, uh, Senators, uh, appreciate a favorable review. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helms. Good to see you. Uh, for the rest of the committee, Mr. Helms, I used to be neighbors once upon a time. So good to see you. Two pedestrians died last night in, in District 20, sir. Thank I saw you. that. I saw it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll move on to Salih. You're up. Okay. Can you hear me? I just unmuted. Okay. Good Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Regina Cooper Ali. I'm the Public and Government Affairs Manager for AAA Mid Atlantic, representing both Maryland and Washington, D.C. And obviously, we are very much in support of Senate Bill 147 and certainly uh, appreciate Senator Walt Stryker for his leadership in putting this bill in on behalf of uh, AAA as well as our 1 million member. Uh, members in the state of Maryland. Uh, as has been said, uh, we certainly do have books already, laws already on the books that uh, should be providing additional protections, not only to uh, our first responders, our tow truck operators, but we feel that and AAA was certainly instrumental in helping get those, getting those laws passed, not only here in Maryland, but across the country. But we feel as Senator Wallstriker said that it's the next logical step would be to protect all of the motorists or pedestrian, all of our motorists who may be on the side of the road with a disabled vehicle. We also feel that there's been a little bit of confusion among motorists as to which type of vehicles the law applies to. And we believe that passage of Senate Bill uh, 147 would help alleviate that confusion and that they know that they need to slow down and move over whenever there's a vehicle displaying hazard lights or emergency lights on the side. We also know at AAA that about 32% of motorists don't recognize that the law exists. And again, we believe that passage would help uh, alleviate some of the ambiguity or confusion. And I can also say that AAA Mid-Atlantic conducted a poll last year, actually in the fall, where 84% of Maryland drivers who took that poll said that they would certainly support extending the state's move over law to disabled vehicles. So with that said, on behalf of AAA and our one, one, over 1 million members in the state of Maryland, we certainly urge the committee to issue a favorable report. And thank you, Ms. Ali. And with that, that'll conclude the testimony for Senate Bill 147. Unless there are questions from the committee, I see one from Senator West. Senator West, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, in my experience driving on highways, um, there are very narrow shoulders and there are very wide shoulders. Um, and when the shoulder is narrow, meaning that the car off on the side is really close to the travel lane, I traditionally have tried to move over to the left. On the other hand, when the shoulder is really wide and the car is well off the road, um, typically I have not moved over to the left. The, the bill doesn't make any differentiation. Maybe we can't make any differentiation, but I wondered if the AAA representative wanted to address that question. Well, that's a, certainly a, a good point, Senator West, and I, and I actually do the same thing. I make it a habit to move over regardless, but you're absolutely right that some of the shoulders are wider than others. But I would think that uh, in an effort to not have an ambiguity and confusion that we would like to see it apply despite whatever 
size uh, the shoulder is. Okay. I thought that was what you were going to say, but I wanted to ask the question anyway. Thanks. I appreciate the question, sir. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Senator West. Any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, that will conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 147. Mr. Helms, David, I'll give you a holler back on my, uh, on my way home tonight, but good to see you. I'll definitely give you a call. All right. Uh, so next up, we have Senate Bill 105, Senator Wallstrecker. Vice Chair Wallstrecker, you're up. Uh, thank you once more, Mr. Chairman. Let me also give a shout out to Mr. Helms. He's not a constituent, but I know he works with many of my constituents um, on issues of pedestrian safety, bike safety, and road safety. So I appreciate your being here today, Mr. Helms. Uh, so before us now is Senate Bill 105. Um, under this uh, bill, suspension of a vehicle registration for video toll debt would no longer be permissible, but flagging for non-renewal would still be allowed. Uh, we did this recently for red light camera debt. Uh, this bill also applies for, to any future reciprocity agreements between Maryland and other states. Uh, so, you know, we've undertaken a project here in JPR and the House has done that as well. And that is uh, the decriminalization of poverty. And this fits squarely within that bucket. Maryland is an outlier in, um, in suspending registration for video toll debt. The best practice used successfully in other states who have also sought to decriminalize poverty is to simply flag the registration for non-renewal and to enter into toll reciprocity agreements with nearby states. MDTA currently charges a $25 per transaction late fee for video tolls as low as $1.40. This means that the vast majority of toll debt consists not of the debt itself, but of late fees. Some drivers report incurring fees, late fees without ever having even received notice for the original toll. This issue is even more urgent now than it has been in previous years, and let me tell you why. Um, a couple of years ago, MDTA um, switched vendors. So uh, we like to think that it's actually the government sending these bills and doing the customer service and creating the website. In fact, it's a private third-party vendor. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when um, the switchover happened, uh, a lot of um, unintended consequences happened. And uh, that, that switchover in vendors also happened right around when COVID hit and when MDTA switched to a fully cashless system and pause mailing of video toll notices. So here's what happened. There was a tremendous backlog and now MDTA is mailing out the bills for that backlog. And that will continue through the summer of 2022. Now, according to MDTA, 18% of video toll notices mailed came back as undeliverable. In other words, because the backlog was so steep and people have since moved, almost one in five of the notification of toll debts is not being delivered to their intended recipient. And that means 20% of the people with toll debt don't know they have toll debt and are subject to getting pulled over on the side of the road and, um, and cited for a registration uh, that has been suspended when they had no idea that they owed money in the first place. And as you might imagine, those law enforcement interactions won't go well when people um, are accused of having toll debt and their license suspended when in fact they didn't know that they had such toll debt. And for that reason, it's important that we time shift this so that people can continue to drive on our roads legally become aware of the toll debt that is owed, grieve that toll debt should they desire to do so. And then if they still don't pay after all those opportunities, uh, the MVA can, can, um, can, can deny them the right to re-register their vehicles. And that's what most states do. And for that reason, I hope you will support SB 105. Thank you, Vice Chair Walsh-Riker. We'll now move on to your panel. Mr. Schneiderman, you are up. Good to see you. Welcome. We'll have to unmute. There you go. There you go, one more time. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? We can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Smith, 
members of the committee for the opportunity to address uh, this piece of legislation. Good to see everyone again. I'm Franz Schneiderman. I work with an organization that works for safety and transparency uh, and affordable driving for Maryland drivers and car buyers, and it's called Consumer Auto. We support this bill because we think that the state's practice, as Senator Waldstriker explained, of um, suspending these registrations is really unduly punitive. Uh, and it's particularly damaging for lower income Marylanders who often don't have, either don't have an easy pass or don't have a credit card that will automatically replenish the easy, easy passes and who therefore can accumulate these video toll uh, citations very quickly. Maryland has fairly high uh, fees for each, each citation, $25 for each citation, I believe, $25 late fees. And then there's a 17% um, added fee that the CCU uh, imposes for its collection practices if, you're, if you get behind on these things. So it's, and as Senator Waldstrecker explained many times, the uh, notices don't go to the right address or there's some other problems uh, and people don't get them in a timely fashion. And it's pretty easy for people to accumulate large debt and if they if their licenses get suspended as a result, then of course some people will choose to keep driving anyway because they need to to get to work and to handle their affairs. And then of course they can get into even greater legal trouble. Uh, and it's just it's a criminalization of property issue, and it it becomes it sort of snowballs into big, bigger problems. And this affects a surprisingly large number of Marylanders. Between 2015 and 2018, it 22,000 Marylanders had their license had, had their registration suspended in this way. Now I don't have a current figure, but given the giant backlog of these fees that are going out, I'm afraid that it's going to be impacting an even larger number of people. I believe MDTA announced in November that they were at a backlog of 23 million of these video tolling fees that they would be. Uh, doling out to consumers through uh, the middle of 2022. And of course, many of them are old fees that are not going to the right address. Um, I'm sorry? Um, anyway, many of them are old fees that aren't going right, to the right the, address. Uh, that was so, the time. Yeah, uh, go ahead. If you briefly conclude, but there you oh, go. Okay. So I'm sure, I'm sure we're going to have many people in trouble. For, in, in trouble. Um, we support um, rescinding the practice. I believe 42 states, only eight states still suspend registrations for these kind of fees. Uh, I think the House passed this legislation this year. Love to see the Senate pass it this year as well and bring some relief to the people in need. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Snyderman. And with that, if there are no questions, then that will conclude the hearing for Senate. Oh, actually, hold on, we have Senator Cassidy. Yeah, I guess maybe just a question for the sponsor. Are, are we concerned at all that, I, I realize this comes up because originally we didn't have all, um, all these video lanes, everything's strictly video now. And so that caused, actually we didn't used to have video at all. We just had to stop and pay the toll. So you kind of knew that you weren't doing it. And I've had a license, I, I had an instance where there was an administrative confusion so I was being recorded as not paying tolls, but it was going to a different account and got kind of confusing, took the six months to resolve. So I understand we're going here, but how do we, <clears throat> I mean, it, it's, so I, I register and I have a long a number of years, I think it's 12 months that I re, so how often do we re-register? I'm not even sure the vehicle is it, it's every couple of years, right? I think it's every two years. Yeah. If that's correct, yeah. Yeah, so if I start violating this register, it would be two years before I actually am in a position where I have to, if, if this is screwing up, I'll have two years of accumulated fines. We concern that for some people, you know, I, I, if I would have dealt with this in the first month, uh, it would have been somewhat more manageable. Now I've got two years worth of penalties and interest and fines, we're gonna put folks in a position where they just quite frankly, 
they're, they're in a position now where there's no way they can recover this and they're going to be locked out. Um, yeah. So I think that's a real concern. And MDTA um, mentions that concern in their letter of information. And so um, I, I think it's a legitimate question that we have to ask ourselves, but it's not determinative. In other words, even if you argue that, that some people may um, continue to accumulate debt because we are time shifting this to the re-registration, you still have to balance that against the law enforcement consequences of people having their uh, registration suspended in between their registration periods and whether which, which concern you believe to be the greater concern. In my mind, the concern that is the greater concern is having many more people have their registration suspended and having possible challenging law enforcement interactions because so many people don't know that their registration is being suspended because they don't know that they have the debt. The other thing is, um, you know, MDTA allows for payment plans. And so even if in your circumstance, someone continues to accumulate debt over a longer period of time because of this legislation, that doesn't prevent them from establishing a payment plan so that they can pay that money back over time in a way that is amenable to their budget. And so um, I think the concern you raise is a real one and I don't dismiss it and I appreciate MDTA raising it um, in their letter of information. But I think the balance of the policy still weighs towards passing this legislation because of uh, the benefits that we get. And just um, unrelated to the question, I, I neglected earlier, Mr. Chairman, that just to thank my cross-file delegate Al Carr, who I also represent with in District 18, he's had this legislation for many years and has been um, an incredible champion on this issue. So I just wanted to, to thank him publicly. Thank you. All right, uh, Senator West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanna pick up on Senator Cassidy's line of questioning. Um, I, didn't someone say a few minutes ago that there are 23 million outstanding um, tolls? That's, that's just, uh, as Senator Cassidy said, time was you couldn't, you had to pay the money. <laughs> and, and if you didn't have the money, I'm not sure what you did at a toll booth, but you didn't, you didn't go through a toll booth repeatedly without paying the money. Now people do that. Uh, and, and I am concerned that two years down the road, as, as Senator Cassidy said, somebody could have built up just a mountain of these tolls and not be able to pay them. Um, maybe an in-between um, solution, partial solution, might be to... Uh, enable police to pull someone over and give them a citation for having too many unpaid tolls and which would require them to go to court. They're not, they're not going to sustain their, sustain their license, but they end up going to court uh, and the judge gives them a lecture. Um, does that sound like something? Because other, otherwise, uh, as, as Senator Cassidy said, something two years down the road is going to have a hard time working off all this debt that they've accumulated. I, I'm just thinking outside the box here, trying to find some way in between day one and day yeah. 720 when they have to renew their license where, where there's some accountability. Yeah, I, I think that's right. But let me push back because I, I think um, the whole purpose of the bill is to eliminate law enforcement encounters on the street, um, which could turn bad. Uh, over um, unpaid debt. And so, um, and so I, I would push back on your solution, but let me clarify first the 23 million uh, number. Uh, that's, that's obviously not the number of people with toll debt. We, you know, um, we only have six and a half million people here in the state. Um, and certainly it's not even the fault of the people, you know, the 23 million um, citations is not mainly the fault of the people um, who those are being mailed to. Um, MDTA did something that it thought was the right decision at the time, which is we're gonna suspend the collection of toll debt during COVID, during the emergency order. And um, what they could have done, and what I think many of us would think would be the wise thing to do, would be to mail these things out and say, listen, because of COVID, you don't have to pay this right now, but you'll have to pay it. 
to give people uh, notice of what they owed. Instead, MDTA didn't mail anything at all. And so people are receiving bills for two-year-old toll debt. And so that 23 million outstanding is not because there are 23 million instances of people trying to take advantage of the system or not pay the tolls that they owe. It's because of MDTA's own negligence. It's just a bad policy. Hey, everyone doesn't have to pay for a while, except we're gonna mail out bills later when you've already moved and when you have absolutely no recollection of which uh, toll booth you went through. And in fact, on the easy pass form, um, we're not even gonna tell you exactly which place you went through. We're gonna put a code uh, and then you're gonna have to look up that code and figure out which booth you went through. And so as you might imagine, people um, don't understand when they receive these bills, oftentimes don't agree that they were liable for it. And as Senator Cassidy mentioned, when mistakes are made uh, and they are frequent, unfortunately, and, I, and I've had that in my, my own life, um, it, it's really challenging to resolve those things. And so a lot of people receive these, make the phone call to fix it, but they can't get someone on the other end of the line or they get someone on the other end of the line who agrees that it's a mistake, but it never gets resolved administratively on the back end. Uh, and so the money continues to be owed. And so um, I think the appropriate thing is to give people the time and space um, to work out their uh, objections to any bills that they've received. And then if indeed they still continue to, own, to owe toll debt at the end of the registration period, they can work out a payment, payment plan with MDTA to make sure that the state gets paid what it's owed. Senator West nodding. Okay, great. Uh, any further questions from the members of the committee? Seeing none, that will conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 105. Thank you, Vice Chair Walsh-Riker. That also concludes our hearings for the day. Uh, so thank you all very much. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good one.